In Odin we trust. This is one of the motives of Odinist groups, believers in Odinism, a concept lately circulating in the American press because of a gruesome murder. So a couple of years ago two teenage girls were murdered in Delphi, Indiana and recently the attorneys of the main suspect in the case handed in a long memorandum presenting evidence that allegedly the murders were committed by believers in Odinism. Essentially a, an extreme strain of Nordic neo-paganism. So the press started talking a lot about Odinism, more or less accurately. So one presenter, for example, stated that um, it is an ancient religion, but that's not accurate. And let me explain to you in this video what Odinism actually is, what we're dealing with, its relevance, because its ideology and potential dangers go way past this murder case. With regard to this particular uh, murder, I must say though that even the most extremist strains of neo-paganism, I, I don't think anyone condones human sacrifice or ritual killing and the, uh, motif present, the motive presented, I think, has to do a little bit with speculation and uh, sensationalism. So there is definitely something um, missing here and it might have been all made up. But Odinism is still extremely important for the current political and ideological situation and let me explain to you why. There are many ways in which people create paganisms today and there's really no way of saying this is more authentic than that. Uh, it has to do a lot with the personal experience and interpretation of uh, of the sources. So you have different approaches of cosmology, deities, mythology, and so on and so forth, um, different cultural practices within medieval writings of Northern Europe, which together with archaeological interpretations form the basis of a personal experience. So we usually talk about reconstructionism um, when discussing neo-paganism, but really the point is not to recreate pagan societies or rituals. And besides, we have such flimsy evidence regarding rituals that that seems like an impossible task. The idea is to use those sources from the past in order to create new religious, spiritual and ritual experiences and structures to suit the present uh, day. Practitioners themselves seem to warn against a too great involvement with the topic of accuracy or correctness uh, because the personal practice and experience seems to have uh, the highlight here. So it has to do not with the academic interpretation of particular uh, pieces of the poetic edda, for example. No, it has to do with, um, with the way you perceive them and how such sources may shed light on your spiritual ancestors concept of soul and uh, spirit or religious practice. In Iceland, for example, practitioners are called Ausatlamen and the main organization is called Ausatla Fetlahir. And this has actually gained recognition as a religious organization, though often the religious practice is just referred to our way or the old way. So for example, in Sweden, you have Bonset, which is basically the uh, old way or ways. So we really have a very fluid approach of the sources. He thus can engage with the poetic Edda as a rich source material, um, as an inspiration, for example, the sayings of the High One, so Odin sayings as some kind of uh, basis for a, for a moral code of conduct. And then again, you have the two ritual forms which are the most uh, known and used, Blot and Sumbel. Um, the first one refers to a ritual of offering, and the second one is rather a ritual of remembering, naming and praising through toasting. Many groups would use these two rituals as a way to construct community and to devise their own formal or uh, semi-formal rituals. And um, as a matter of fact, a lot of them are actually scripted. And if you do have a scripted blot ritual, you're also going to have uh, some kind of leader. And the term was borrowed from Icelandic, Godim, which means both priest and chieftain. And this leader would choose a sacred space and then invite local spirits to participate call out on the two main family of gods, the Asir and uh, the Vanya to be present, and then um, an intention or a wish is to be declared, an offering usually of drink is made, and um, yeah, then again some rituals tend to have a more narrow focus on a particular deity or um, spiritual being being asked to participate in uh, the blood. Active um, Requi active participation is also required from the members, so everyone can participate in one form or another. They're asked to draw on their knowledge of the 
beings and also to draw on their own spiritual experiences or wishes or intentions. Um, there are also elements like singing and dancing and role playing and uh, reenactment and so on and so forth. Retellings from Old Norse mythology are also pretty common and um, they all serve one purpose which is the construction of a particular community. But mind you, there is considerable variation both in who can be a member of this community and in what understandings of the self, spirits and um, virtues can or should be adopted. Heathen groups may make lists of rules in order to demonstrate that theirs is a true religion with an ethical commitment, probably to gain state recognition or if not state recognition, then just uh, to convince other faith groups that they also deserve some kind of status. However much derived from all the literature and archaeology, we also need to remember that heathenry was born particularly in the problematic ages of nationalism and of a little more extreme brand of nationalism. So we're dealing with the 19th and 20th century worlds. This means that there is also a political tension involved. And with regard to heathenry, this tension basically boils down to um, the difference between two very broadly defined groups, the more inclusive ones, also known as universalist, um, which basically states that anyone who feels a calling or who feels drawn to this uh, pre-Christian world can be and should become a heathen. And then there are other groups and forms which actually privilege ancestry, physical ancestry, and a very narrow understanding of cultural uh, heritage. And we still use the term folkish to define those, uh, those groups. And at the same time, when discussing the American case, it is important to point out that there are connections between the um, American understanding of the term race and the adoption of some elements from Northern European mythology and practice by adherents of the far right. The link between ethnicity and religion has never been a simple one. Um, there has been this problematic assumption that distinct peoples of the past could be clearly identified um, by their culture and spirituality and that these were clearly separated from one another and that culture associated with spirituality, language and race formed some kind of coherent uh, entity or coherent unity, an ideology which has um, acquired a great deal of importance, particularly in the 20th century with the ideology of National Socialism. One contemporary trend takes neo-paganism to the extreme, and that trend is Odinism. Odinism is a term which became known after the UK-based organization Odinic Right was founded in 1973. So this was an organization basically stating that Odinism was the natural religion of Indo-European peoples and they basically stated that whatever Northern Europeans believed was the best and ultimate thing in the world to aspire to and it was the ultimate expression of the race of these uh, of these people and they also have some uh, moral precepts and one of these precepts stated that you should not put your faith in the pledged word of a stranger people so they definitely had this idea of differentiating themselves from a lot of other categories that simply did not fit their um, world view and you have here a very romanticized idea of a very static past so you have the assumption that whatever northern european peoples were they never changed they were like this ever since um, the first uh, uh, people appeared in that particular space and um, on the other hand you have the inclusivist philosophy I mentioned before which is completely um, put aside by these people it's completely rejected now the late 1990s saw a particular rise in racist paganism and this actually became one of the most dynamic expressions of the white power culture in the 90s this should not mislead us into believing that racism is somehow inherent to to paganism that is simply not true but we do have some potential intersections in certain groups or scenes now the invention of these 
classifying methods using race and nation are products of modernity and thus probably unknown to the pagan cultures of pre-christian europe but they are known to us and they are also known to um, to pagans nowadays living in social um, realities long governed by such classifications and uh, despite that they still cling to the idea of an organic link between ethnicity and religion which obviously implies that somehow your genetics um, determines your spiritual disposition so you're basically born with a system of, uh, of beliefs um, which are inherent to you and they're also linked to your particular ethnicity and uh, and race now a search of racist paganism is um, linked to the radical radicalization of white power culture and this means on the one hand you reject christianity and on the other hand you see the future in the past so what these people are attempting to do is to reconstruct some pre-christian tradition of ancient europe as the white man's true religion it should also be said that during the flower power era um, racist americans were pretty much christian and mainly caught up with the um with the Ku Klux Klan projects of um, the 100% Americanism, um, while countercultural pagans, so not necessarily the northern ones, but also the ones who blended in all kinds of uh, yeah bizarre beliefs uh, from all over the world, um, actually tended to be left-wing hippies. However, comparatively more racist pagans came with the second wave when flower power had given way to the more reactionary winds of the Reagan Bush era and many white racists have made the transition to the underground white power scene. Protestantism is essentially a combination between white supremacy and neo-paganism. Now, there is one person particularly connected to this scene who actually founded the oldest existing organization on the uh, Norse pagan scene in 1969, and that person is Elsa Christensen. She initially lived in Florida, but then she moved uh, to British Columbia, and she is originally uh, Danish. She's also called the mother of racist Odinism because she introduced significant elements later adopted by many racist pagans, including her identification of Norse paganism as the racial soul of the Aryan folk. So she definitely adopted some ideas from, um, for example, Carl Jung, who spoke of the heathen gods and goddesses as being race specific so like i said she was born in denmark in 1913 and she has an interesting political trajectory because she initially was an anarchist she then converted to the national bolshevist wing of the nazi movement and her husband was also a lieutenant in the very small danish national so socialist workers party um, then he was later arrested when um, uh, germany occupied Denmark. Following the war, Christensen moved to Toronto in Canada and developed contacts with the emergent white power scene, um, including the American Nazi Party and um, an important organizer by the name of James Warner. We talked a lot about the Aryan folk soul and to her the primary source of Odinism was biological. So the genesis um, is in our race, she said, and she even found it a pagan tabloid called the Odinist where everyone who was overtly racist could spill their rubbish and there was a lot going on about Aryanism, Aryan freedom, Aryan culture, Aryan self-determination and so on and so forth. Neither of these ideas was actually new. What she did was basically to transfer them um, into this new milieu where she gained a lot of supporters. She was also very fond of fascism, big surprise, but she saw its uh, failure in the fact that it was actually centralized. So as an alternative, she said that it would have been better to have some kind of anarchism um, linked to it because anarchism seeks the dissolution of authoritarian government. And in this way, you could decentralize responsibility and you could organize society in monolithic forms, some kind of tribes folkish tribes, folkish communes, and she also claimed that pre-Christian Norse, um, pre Norse society was organized as tribal socialism, which was basically 
wrong because you have structures. You have structures both in Scandinavia, you have elites, um, and even in the Icelandic Commonwealth, you do have an organizational form that overpasses this idea of small units not communicating with them uh, with one another. So her main point was basically to keep races apart according to their own unique racial souls. There was, of course, a lot of preoccupation with the idea of, of purity um, and also an environmental uh, concern. So, like I said, it, all kinds of ideas borrowed from National Socialism and transferred um, into, into a new context. Um, the mind, body, race, environment was key here. So, um, yeah, one of the main purposes of your life was to bring up pure and healthy children as a building block of this new racial, pure racial organism. And somehow this was compatible with all the um, American longing for the simple lifestyle of the free Yemen in the good old days. In the 80s, and I think this is very important, she began a prison outreach ministry. So she started preaching out in uh, prisons and in, within a few years she even got Odinism to be officially accepted as a legitimate religion in the state of Florida. It was Votan's Folk, an organization established in 1995 by David and Katia Lane and also Ron McVan. It had its headquarters in Idaho and this quickly became a propaganda center spreading the Aryan message throughout the country and uh, also in prisons, especially in prison as, prisons as a matter of fact. David Lane was your ultimate conspiracy theorist. He believed in the Zionist theory, for example, that the US administration was controlled by racial enemies attempting to establish a global Jewish dictatorship. He was convinced that the Aryan man was an endangered species and he also coined the famous 14 words which are used by a lot of neo-Nazi organizations throughout the world as a rallying point. We must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. Alongside the numbers 14 and 88, they are among the most um, employed propaganda um, motos in this uh, scene. So they basically rejected the self, what they considered to be the self-denying Christianity because it was too weak a religion and they needed something a little more um, warmongerish, something preaching war, plunder, um, like yeah, the northern um, ancestral religion or past. And through this, they considered to reconnect, to be able to reconnect with the uh, Aryan race. And the god Odin, for example, uh, they interpreted as a iron-willed warrior god. So anything else was pretty much in um, in the shadow. Although Odin is in himself a very complex um, god, they also insisted on the idea of um, uh, the archetypes, of powerful archetypes residing in every person, which could be reached through performing certain rituals and ceremonies developed by allegedly developed by ancestors in times immemorial. Um, they also like Nietzsche quite a lot and the theory of the Superman, uh, no wonder. And in um, the more occult NS, you also have this idea of the mystery of the blood, this, this belief that the unmixed blood carries some kind of genetic memory of an ancestral uh, past that needs to be uh, revived. This is mixed with all kinds of uh, ideas about uh, the cyclical time, also of oriental uh, inspiration. So the golden age, the fall, and then cleansing, renewal, some kind of universalist uh, approach of the racial paganist ideology. Well, I said in other words that the so-called gods of blood are going to return with a vengeance and the spiritual development of every individual should begin and continue with stuff like meditation, contemplation, unleashing your runic chakras, whatever those are, and of course taking part in a lot of ceremonies. Many of these ceremonies are actually common ground with the other pagan, neo-pagan organizations, but some stuff is specific. For example, they have the Ein Heriat Fraternities, which basically refers to the uh, warriors chosen by Odin for the ultimate battle of Ragnarok, but it is this time interpreted in racial terms, so warriors chosen for the ultimate battle of races or something like that. 
Um, and they actually did a pretty good job at uh, spreading out this racist take hijacking of Norse mythology in, uh, in prisons. This has to do a lot with the reputation of certain people. So they, David Lane is a very well-known person in um, white power circles. And Katya Lane, for example, also led a very successful campaign uh, in the fact that now all states permit the wearing of Thor's hammer as a religious medallion. I think it's no wonder that a lot of people in prison uh, adhere to this kind of religion or of um, cult because when you feel extremely socially isolated um, and you feel like society is not giving you any other uh, chance because you know American prisons are not really known for their rehabilitation programs um, it's quite easy to fall for such extremist uh, ideologies so they're basically told that they're going to be at some point um, on the front line of a battle for the preservation of uh, of their race and uh, they are in desperate need to cling on to something so they are going to find a new identity in such a movement. With regard to the case I mentioned at the very beginning of this um, explanatory video I don't really think that it fits the worldview of these people you know killing a white child stands in contradiction uh, with one of their main principles which is the advancement of the um, white race. Um, furthermore you know, if you have a murder scene and you notice all kinds of weird objects spread around or the bodies in a certain, let's say, un unnatural position or if, if it's something very bizarre and ritual looking, it doesn't automatically mean that it was ritual. So this memorandum, as far as I understood, talked a lot about certain twigs um, displayed on the bodies made to resemble um, some runes, for example. Um, I'm not really sure that we can conclude from that, um, that it was an Odinic thing, um, because when you're a murderer and if you're inexperienced, um, there's a lot going on in your head, especially after committing the deed, and you start, well, experimenting with stuff, experimenting with the bodies, um, because, well, either you cannot cope very well with what you did or you have some kind of theatrical fantasy going on in your head and you want to uh, set it set it up somehow to to fit your image um, about the whole um, the whole thing so that's one other possible explanation for what has been going on um, then if the girls in this case really had connections to Odinists, like to, to people, maybe somebody in the social uh, milieu, in the social network, um, perhaps it was some kind of vengeance due to, yeah, I don't know, whatever personal reasons, racial mixing, or I, I have no idea. But if it, if these people really committed this murder, it, it might have had to do, it must have had to do something with, uh, with a very, very personal reason. But other than that, for the time being, um, I don't think the evidence is, um, is conclusive. Now, this is not to say Odinists um, are innocent people. No, Odinists have been known to have committed some pretty heinous crimes and were involved in acts of terrorism. Terrorism is actually supported by uh, this kind of groups and the Center for Investigative Reporting, for example, reviewed at least six cases from 2001. And in Europe, for example, um, the Norwegian Anders Breivik, who killed 77 uh, people a while ago also had a similar concept of Old Norse religion and what Old Norse religion should be. So Odinism is perfect for attracting people who already have some kind of far-fetched ideas about um, corrupted institutions uh, by outsiders and it is also a very empowering ideology for those feeling cast aside for some reason and, um, you know, combined with certain personality traits or uh, violent, aggressive um, fantasies or just as a place of refuge if you feel unaccepted by, um, by the world around you. So I think it is a good time for Odinists right now because they fit into this general rising trend of the far right due to their narrative about Western cultural greatness and um, the link between nationalism and whiteness. And it's also not such a great time for us people engaging with Norse mythology, historically, academically speaking, 
um, pretty much because we feel like ripping off our faces when we hear about this kind of stuff, um, which is yet another example of mythology being used and abused to fit the far-right political agenda. So I would like to know your opinion about this connection between heathenism and far-right extremism and uh, write a comment, like and subscribe if you found out interesting stuff from this video um, and I hope to see you next time. Have a good day and if you are a heathen or you decide to become a heathen, um, be careful what strain of neo-paganism you choose. Choose wisely.